Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. According to Allied Market Research, the space tourism industry worldwide generated $598 million in 2021 and is expected to reach $12.6 billion by 2031, which sounds impressive, but there are headwinds. Of course, space tourism is about more than those with the means to buy a ride on Virgin Orbit, Blue Origin, and even from SpaceX through third-party brokers. What else is under the umbrella of space tourism? Well, my guest is John Spencer, CEO of the Space Tourism Society. And John, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. It's always nice to have you back, and it's always a great conversation. So thanks very much for joining us. How has COVID affected space tourism, John? You know, I didn't notice a lot uh, of effect on space tourism. We were all working out of our homes or offices and still moving things forward. Uh, in 2021, rather than having an in-person uh, conference, our space tourism, our annual space tourism conference, we had to have a Zoom conference over two days. That worked out pretty well. And then when we came uh, to the next space tourism conference, there's always on April 28th here in Los Angeles. Uh, the one last year in 2022 felt like we were all beginning to come out of fact of COVID was the first major indoor public event I had been to for almost two years. There was this feeling of we're back, which added a certain energy and optimism and ambiance to the whole conference uh, that carried through all the sessions and the events and stuff. So uh, other than just normal dealing with COVID, I didn't see it have any effect. And 2021 kicked off the most amazing year in history for the space tourism industry. So that that proved itself moving forward very well. Well, and of course, COVID had different effects in different parts of the country. I know you're out in California where it was locked down pretty tight. I'm in Florida where we had a lot more freedom to move around and go out and do things. So it, probably there were some regional differences in how that was all affected. I think you're right. Uh, but, you know, this is a national industry. People from around the country are involved sure. in the space enterprise industry and now space tourism continues to grow and diversify. And we had a we have a pretty wide view of the space tourism experience. It's not just real space flight, but Earth-based experiences like National Space Museums and the theme parks and IMAX theaters and of course movies and TV and games are all providing space-oriented experiences. And I consult on a lot of those. So there's really this kind of wide tapestry of different levels of space experiences that we focus on at the conference and in our research and planning work. Unfortunately, kind of on the heels of COVID, we wound up in what some are calling a worldwide recession. The economy has definitely slowed down regardless of, of what label you put on, it, put on it. So what are you seeing as far as the effects of the, the economic slowdown on space tourism? Some of the investment community people have pulled back a bit. I've noticed that uh, this year or basically. But over the last, say, even three years, the investment community has absolutely woken up into the idea that space enterprise and space tourism is a part of that, is an industry that's going to have almost limitless growth, growth, high probability, uh, profitability, and also it's just a very sexy, exciting uh, industry to be in. So there was a lot of investment and investigation into investing in space-related ventures in even 2020, 21, 22, slowing a little now, but there's still new players involved, which is the most important part, who've never invested uh, in the space industry before. So let's talk about some of the wins that we saw for space tourism in 2022. What were some of the highlights? The year started off with two highlights, of course. One was the uh, Axiom Space First Passenger Mission, uh, which was in April. And they had uh, three passengers and one professional astronaut flew up on a you know Falcon 9 Dragon capsule and spent about 17 days actually on board the International Space Station. And each of the passengers paid $55 million and had a great time. Fortunately, they uh, uh, safely landed, splashed down uh, four days before our conference on April 28th. 
So Axiom Space was a big participant in the conference. Uh, and that just worked out very well. It was all part of our award show as part of the conference as well. Uh, during the rest of the year, things slowed down a little bit from 2021 and uh, activities. There were some issues related to what Blue Origin was doing. Virgin Galactic was still maturing, trying to do things. Um, you know, SpaceX was moving forward on a whole variety of things. So there's pushes and pullbacks, pushes and pullbacks like any industry, but the big picture looks very good because of the diversity of the industry and also the range of investors and people who want to participate, who want to have that life-changing space experience. Why do you feel like it is that SpaceX is working all through third-party brokers as opposed to doing their own space tourism like Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic? And I've got another question relating to those two companies as well. But but why do you think it is that that Elon Musk has said, no, we're just gonna we're gonna let somebody else do our sales for us, basically? Well, that just must be his strategy. Um, again, Gwen Shotwell really runs the runs the shop. Um right. And sometimes there's, so, well, as you know, there's so much involved in real space flight and designing and developing new vehicles. And that's one of the main areas Elon's interested in his Starship and other technologies that uh, outsourcing uh, marketing and booking flights uh, just makes sense. And so far it's working. But let's then go back and talk about Blue Origin, which had a booster failure, so they haven't flown since then. Obviously, that was on a on an unmanned flight, but still, they've they've got to prove that their booster is still safe. Uh, and then Virgin Galactic also hasn't flown since there was an airspace violation, and they're announcing a five hundred million dollar loss for twenty twenty two. Are these major crises, or are they bumps in the road? Well, for Virgin, I think it's a crisis. Uh, for Blue Origin, it's probably just a bump in the road. And I understand, and I'm not directly involved with that company, but you know, we talk to everybody all the time. Their big focus is on their next rocket, much larger New Glenn, mm -hmm. which is an orbital vehicle. And their long-term goal is, of course, and just been one of Jeff Bezos' personal life goals, is developing a base and a resort on the moon. So in this stepping stone that Blue Origin is going through, they've been learning and testing and trying, but they're now focusing more, I understand, on New Glenn. They'll certainly fix what's going on with New Shepard and fly again, but they have a, a long-term vision and program and pretty well limitless capital resources. Virgin Galactic is in a different position being a publicly held company. And we hear rumors from credible sources of other companies getting involved in the space tourism industry. Um, you know, uh, Relativity Space is moving forward. I think tomorrow they're doing their launch of a first vehicle. And space tourism is certainly part of their program, as well as other companies want to do that as well. Have there been any major ripple effects, in your opinion, from those kinds of setbacks with Virgin and Blue? Yes, I think so. Um, you know, people really look at what's going on, especially when they're doing due diligence on investments. And I have a feeling right now, and we're experiencing this with some of our conference participants um, who have delayed making commitments on some things, but they will. People are doing a little bit of a wait and see. You know, what's really happening with all these different things. And of course, in the big picture, the potential major game changer is if Elon uh, uh, Starship actually goes into operation. That's a huge, huge game changer. So there's a little bit I have noticed. I'm pretty obviously attuned to all this. Uh, take a little step back, see what's happening. And uh, as things mature, re-engage when it's a little clearer uh, what's happening. I feel like it was... Um, not advantageous. I wouldn't use that word, but simply... The, the fact that the Blue Origin incident proved that their escape system worked under a real-life condition. It wasn't a test. It was something that the, they actually had a booster failure and the capsule was preserved. And somebody who was in it, I'm sure would have, I'm not sure, but it looks like likely would have survived. Um, is there, is that a, a plus for Blue Origin or is it, does it, does it outweigh the minus of the fact that they lost a booster? They have a huge advantage in having that system to begin with. Um, 
And you really, when you're dealing with rockets, do you want to be able to save uh, crew members and uh, in case there is a disaster? It's rockets. It's dangerous. It's hard. Um, it's amazing how well we've done in all of the numerous uh, space experience flights uh, mm -hmm. since middle of 2021. There's been no accidents. No one's been lost. There have always been pretty successful missions. But the advantage of having an escape system that's proven and works simply adds a range of people who are willing to take that a ride because they know there's a safe system. You mentioned private space stations a few minutes ago. How is that going to affect the overall landscape of space tourism? It's going to widen the range of the kinds of experiences and locations people will be able to visit. So there's at least half a dozen uh, companies diligently developing commercial space stations, almost all of them in their business plans or public statements have said that private space tourism, space sports downline, media production off world are all part of the marketing landscape that they hope to service. So the fact that there will be more locations and each one's a little different. So if you wanted to have a number of different experiences off world, you could. Uh, some of the companies will fail, some will succeed. Uh, and they're testing out a lot of very interesting outer space architecture designs and concepts. And of course, my background is being one of the earliest ever outer space architects. So that's pretty exciting. But the fact that investors today, and I've been in some of these meetings, take this seriously. Now, years ago, they would have said, I'm not even wasting my time with these weird guys. Now they're saying, okay, I want to learn more about this. I see it a potential industry. Uh, tell me more. And that's what you want. Tell me more. I'm talking with John Spencer, CEO of the Space Tourism Society on the Xterra podcast. Take a moment right now to click on subscribe to make sure you don't miss any of our podcasts. Or if you're watching on YouTube, any of the videos from Xterra, the Journal of Space Commerce. All right, John. So we've successfully had the inspiration for X1, some other uh, private space flights. And the Polaris season is about to begin again with Jarek Isaacman of Inspiration4 fame. But is there a way to bring such experiences to those of more modest means? Well, Inspiration4 had three private citizens, none of which are were wealthy in any way, shape, or form. And they were all guests of Jarek, a wealthy person. And we're, we're seeing that happening more and more, that a wealthy person is taking more than just themselves up, for example, the Japanese billionaire Miyazawa uh, in the end of uh, 2021 uh, lifted off to with the Russians and spent uh, over a week on the International Space Station. He actually brought his assistant with him. Hmm. That was one of the first times that people went just as a guest. So um, being a guest of a person is one way. Winning a contest, for example, there are two real uh, major television series in pre-production now. One is called Space Hero, and one is called Do You Want to Be an Astronaut? And there'll be uh, like survivor-type competitions of uh, people selected from around the world, average people. And whoever wins the contest, going through all these exercises and tests, will actually be flown to the International Space Station. So you could win a trip. You could be a guest. People are looking at doing lotteries. There are more companies looking at sending some of their uh, key employees as a benefit, you know, your flight to space. So there are growing ways through which private people can do that. However, the real thing which will be happening in the future is as these commercial space stations, and eventually, you know, I'm developing the orbital yachting industry modeled mm -hmm. after ocean going yachting. People have to work at these facilities in orbit. So you can get a job eventually and get paid of course, our astronauts are paid. It's their job to work in space. As someone who's working at a space uh, commercial space station, eventually commercial space hotel in space, someone has to clean it, cook the meals, you know, maintain it, all those things. So the opportunities to experience space as part of your profession continues to grow and will be a very, very big way of a lot of people, average people, to actually work in space. Do you have any idea of when 
that might become a reality? I mean, should people now or young people, at least not not people our age, probably, but but should young people be thinking about, you know, if I'm going to be a welder or a plumber or a, an architect or something of that nature, maybe I should be start thinking about space? Yes. And in fact, what's interesting is around the United States, there's more and more classes being offered in space-related careers, whether it's space law, space medicine, space architecture, other areas. Uh, and young people see this as career paths and are interested. In fact, we're seeing an uptick on younger people attending our space tourism conference because we talk a lot about, and this will grow program programmatically, uh, potential careers in space. So to answer your question, yes, get a get a job, go to go to school, study all this stuff, get a job at one of the space companies, and eventually you can have a career going to and from space, which is basically your work site. Doesn't sound like a bad gig. <laughs> let's, let's talk about the Space Tourism Conference just a little <clears throat> bit. It's coming up, as you mentioned, April the 28th in Los Angeles. What can folks that are attending expect? Sure. The reason we always use April 28th uh, for our major events of the Space Tourism Society is that is the date in 2001 when our friend Dennis Tito uh, lifted off from Kazakhstan on a ru Russian rocket Russian Soyuz capsule and became the first individual who paid for his private trip to space. He spent about seven days on the International Space Station. So that's the official kickoff date of the space tourism industry. For our conference, what we do is have a fairly wide ranging program, particularly dealing with those three mediums through which people experience space. If you imagine a triangle at the apex is real space experiences. On one side is earth-based experiences, and the other side is media, movies, TV, games, and so forth. We're directly involved being based in Los Angeles in all three of these areas and have for decades. So we have vast networks in those areas. And space is very popular as a theme that people want to know about, uh, experience, all those kind of things. So our program starts off, how real is all this in the morning of our pro conference? And then by lunchtime, people are sensing, well, this may really be a real industry that's growing. We get a little bit more into what is more about the experience. And the end of the evening, we talk about the inspirational part, which deals with why are we doing this? What does it mean for you, humankind to be exploring our solar system, to be moving outward? Why is this a very noble story that humanity is moving forward? Uh, then we have an award show where we there are more and more candidates to receive major awards from our Space Tourism Society who are pioneering entire new industries, new technologies, new things. So we have all the major players participating in some way. Uh, and what we do is use panels with very few actual presentations because we have found that the audience likes to hear these experts of a particular theme, whether it is a space architecture or it's food in space or it's the financing world. Uh, they want to see experts in those areas discussing it among themselves. And a core of the conference is always baseline of bringing people from diverse groups together to mix it up and to talk about and to envision the future. We are very future oriented. And this fits into one of our big picture quests of having more and more people involved in the space industry also think of themselves as futurist, which most people don't. But you're always talking about the space industry five years, 10 years, 20 years, the destiny of humanity and so forth. So we believe the better our industry is at future forecasting, uh, the better we will be able to perform. And the conference has a nice spirit to it. It's, we make it fun. I mean, this is space entertainment and it's space experience. So uh, last year, we just had wonderful results of people having a great time. In fact, we had what we came to call a ghost conference from last year. The two or three days after our conference, a lot of people stayed at the hotel. This is the Renaissance Hotel right next to LAX here in LA. And we always do our events at one of the big hotels by LAX, it's just very convenient. And people kept meeting in the lobby and going places together and visiting the California Science Center to speed the space, see the space shuttle and see the, the palm trees and all that kind of stuff. So um, there was a feeling of togetherness which is part of our community building, which translated into people on their own, staying longer and getting to know each other better. And we expect that to happen again with this year. Inmarsat recently published a study 
last year. It was titled, What on Earth is the Value of Space? And it indicated that American interest in space is waning. Is that part of a cycle, or do you see that as maybe a threatening trend? Now, we're focused on this, so we're very you know, focused on it and right. stuff. And our perception, paying attention to this, is the opposite. The interest is growing, particularly with young people wanting to have careers in space. And other industries, particularly the, the entertainment industry, uh, wanting to do more space filming. And we're talking to more and more people outside of the space world in the sports industry, because mm -hmm. we believe sports in space is going to be a big part of this whole tapestry of experiences off world. So our perception, which is you know skewed because we pay attention to all this, uh, is the opposite of interest growing and the diversification of the interesting industries and major players in some of those industries paying attention and wanting to get involved is increasing. When you think about the value of space and in space tourism, I'm I went down to Cape Canaveral for the first Artemis scrub. <laughs> and it was the, the number of people who are in that part of Central Florida, I'm thinking about the economic impact on the hotels, the restaurants, um, a lot of those things that people might not normally associate with being with benefiting from space tourism. Are you able to kind of reach out to places where there is that kind of a space industry? And I know I live in Florida and, and that's something that is is pretty common here. But what about in places like in New Mexico where um, there's a spaceport and in some other places like that where they might be able to see some kind of economic benefit from space tourism? Well, there are specific pockets. You mentioned a couple of them, which is Spaceport America in New Mexico, the Space Coast in Florida, uh, Los Angeles, Southern California. There's actually a lot going on in Seattle. So there are certain pockets where the industry is more prominent and technology as well as manufacturing and assembly and testing is happening. Of course, in Houston, Texas, with the Johnson Space Center, that's another hotbed of all kinds of activities happening uh, there. That's where they actually train astronauts. So in specific areas, yes, there's a growth and interest. Other areas, they've had no experience or connection with space, but we're noticing more universities, as I mentioned earlier, around the entire country are offering courses and classes in space-related uh, potential careers. So that in itself, with the people actually doing the classes and everything, is widening the stuff. Now, there are events that happen, for example, Yuri's Night, which is a worldwide celebration on April 8th, celebrating the first human to fly in space, Yuri Gagarin. Uh, that's happening not only in the United States, but around the world, more and more of these, including Antarctica. They always have a party on the International Space Station with our Russian friends there. Mm -hmm. So there are different pockets, different places, and uh, but if you're a young person and you're interested, and even if you're middle-aged, you want to change your career, with a little bit of Google searching, you can connect to the space community. And that's a wonderful community. I'm very happy to have always been part of it. It's people who care about the future, want to be involved, and want to make things better. And space is so exciting. It is our future. And it's a great thing to talk about at parties, for sure. So uh, that works <laughs> out very well, too. So uh, when, I'm, when, I'm very enthusiastic, and uh, the conference is one of those places where the community comes together, and uh, that's an important part to be part of a community with some shared beliefs and doing things you believe is important, and you being part of that and making a difference. Well, I can't tell you, John, when I go to networking events and I tell people that I'm doing a multimedia website that deals in space commerce. And I can't tell you the number of times that I had somebody look at me and say, what do you mean like warehouses? Um, <laughs> and, and no, and that gets me to this next question, which is what can the industry do to educate the public? Are we doing enough? Well, let me go back for a second then I'll address that. But okay. what I learned more than a decade ago is I'd had similar experiences where I said, well, I'm a space architect. Go, oh, you plan offices and stuff. And I go, no, outer space. You no, know, he's a point up most of the time people look. <laughs> right. So I always introduce myself and I'm trying to train everybody else now to say I'm an outer space architect that totally changes the dynamics of the conversation. Everybody stops for about 
two or three seconds as they're processing this, they go, oh, wow, I didn't know there was that kind of thing. Tell me more. Uh, so that I'm trying to get all of our people to say, I'm the outer space doctor. I'm an outer space, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. As to what we can do more is in, it's organically happening with all these classes I'm mentioning, with universities paying attention, more space organizations. There are so many brand new space companies uh, just happening weekly, and I'm not joking. We can't keep track anymore. So there's this growth organically of people interested in it. Now, how do we widen that interest? That will happen mostly through media, through space tourism TV shows. Of course, I'm involved in a couple of those. Space tourism movies, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. That's where you get the public seeing a bigger picture. But once we start doing things in Earth orbit that people can relate to, for example, uh, orbital weddings, mm -hmm. honeymoons on the moon, space regatta races like the American Cup uh, solar sails around the moon, skydiving from Earth orbit, uh, dune buggy races on the moon. And the, the sports industry spends billions of dollars in technology and hosting amazing things. The Formula One race, which is basically going around, around, around really fast. You have to have two billion to host a team. So once we start doing things with movie stars and famous people going and space comedy, sex in space is going to be a big seller, that's for sure. <laughs> but people want to know about what's happening and who's doing it, who's doing what to whom. So the drama of space development is growing. And we've always, we've had now this competition, our billionaires, right? We have Elon and Bezos and Branson and some other people involved. Uh, so the public's paying a little more attention to things they kind of understand and know about. And this relates to one of the things I talk about a lot and we're trying to use as a tool to make a comfort zone, a bridge between current thinking and future thinking on space is we talk about the oceans. And space mm -hmm. is actually very nautical, if you think about it. We talk about spaceships, you know, voyaging in space, all those types of things. So what I say more and more these days, and it kind of works, be creating a comfort zone and understanding foundation to work from, but I say everything we do on today's oceans, except for fishing and drilling for oil and gas, we will be doing in the oceans of space. And that bridge, that thematic bridge, helps. As such, more and more people will be able to pay attention to it, have a bit of a more comfort zone, and possibly even say where they might fit into this whole tapestry that's growing. So what you're basically saying is we need more space influencers, more, more yeah. TikTokers. <laughs> we do. And uh, bloggers and TikTokers and all these kind of people who are doing more space-related stuff. So, I mean, the young generation is pretty swift. And the nice thing is a lot of the young generation think of themselves as world citizens more than a citizen from a specific country because they're friends are around the world. And in the big picture, I think that's good because we all do live on spaceship Earth. You know, mm -hmm. we are on a planet, which is our spaceship, and we are orbiting the sun. So the truth is we are actually in outer space right now. We're just on a really, really big spaceship. Well, I like to think in some very small way that I'm a space influencer myself. So hopefully that's um, that's that's at least part of my role here at Xterra. <laughs> it is. And I love coming on your show and what you guys are doing, the diversity of guests that you have. So you're you're making a difference and you're doing a good job. And we do appreciate it. So well, thank, thank you. you. No, thank you, John. Uh, we're just about out of time. So let's uh, let's do the the traditional wrap up question. And that's to ask you to look out over the next 10 to 15 years and tell us what you see in space commerce and space tourism. The next big thing in space tourism will be lunar flybys, private enterprise hosting lunar flybys. The Russians are planning that. Jim Cameron is hoping to do that, the film director, which we know. Um, then you have the commercial space stations in development, more companies involved in that. Uh, eventually, you're going to be seeing uh, landings on the moon, return to the moon, which is a big deal. Uh, there's been more, many, many more science missions planned to Mars and to the outer solar system. So the unmanned exploration continues and is accelerating and diversifying with more countries flying missions. So that's a very important part, too. And then, as I mentioned earlier, I'm in the process and have for over a decade been developing my ideas, concepts, and designs, which is the fun part, of creating the orbital super yacht industry modeled after ocean-going super and mega yachts. And that's 
potentially in itself a big game changer because the core difficulty with space ventures is it's very expensive, very risky, and it's hard to make a cash profit. Uh, space yachts don't make a cash profit. That's not their purpose. Mm -hmm. Ocean yachts don't make money. They're super expensive to build and operate. The profit is social profit. It's pride and prestige and social standing and gifting. So my quest and plan is designing and developing this industry and have the richest people in the world, richest companies, richest families wanting to have for their next step of showing how rich and powerful I am, an orbital super yacht. And I think that is going to require eventually a much larger orbital infrastructure of orbital super yacht clubs, which I'm designing a real one right now, actually. Uh, a Coast Guard service modeled after you know, the U.S. Coast Guard that we call the Space Guard. And uh, space lanes and how do you rescue and how do you do all these kind of things which we have on the oceans we'll need for the oceans of space. So it's a very dynamic and who knows who's going to come up with some good ideas and stuff. I mean, 20 years ago, none of us knew anything about 3D printing. And now it's an important part of any large scale long term mission planning. John, it's always a fascinating um, uh, conversation with you and good luck with the Space Tourism Conference in about a month or so. And uh, thanks again for being on the program. Thank you for having it. I appreciate it. I, uh, that was a good experience. John Spencer is the CEO of the Space Tourism Society. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Xterra podcast. You can subscribe to the audio version of the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Audible, and many other popular podcasting platforms. Be sure to click on subscribe so you don't miss an episode of the podcast or any of our other videos. You can also get daily space commerce news at xterrajsc.com. And one thing more, be sure to connect with us on LinkedIn and follow us on Twitter at xterrajsc. Until next time, I'm Tom Patton. Thanks for joining us. I want to go faster, faster. Our dreamers' eyes we gaze into a sense of purpose, no my view. Like finding water on